I met a man, a union miner, years ago, that had been violently harassed by militiamen, state troops hired by the coal companies. Colner was his name. They dragged him off the streets, marched him into the hills where he was given a shovel and was forced to dig his own grave. He told me he wasn't even allowed to kiss his wife and children goodbye. The men laughed at him, beat him, berated him until he could take no more. He said he fell face down into the grave, unconscious. And the cowardly men saw the only few precious belongings he had and ran. He awoke, he staggered back to camp half out of his mind. That was right here, in this very state. Oh, I have nursed miners back to health who were abused by the ruthless mine guards. I have reunited families who were torn apart by injustice. And I have fed children who were starved to the bone by the greed of business interests. But never have I witnessed such brutality and suffering as I have seen in Colorado. But I will go wherever I am called, to preach the gospel of workers' rights. That is a task much too great to ignore. That is the task of any true American who wishes not to see his own brothers and sisters in the iron bonds of industrial slavery. So, here I am again. When I first came to Colorado, the whole state was a playground for the Rockefeller family. There wasn't one square inch of land that wasn't owned or couldn't be bought out by the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. And while the rich company owners take vacations to Europe or buy yachts or French lessons for their children, the miners and their families break their backs in the dark, wet, underground tunnels and wither away from starvation. A worker earns his pay in scrip or slips of paper, a poor excuse for compensation that forces patronage at company stores that cheat workers out of their wages using inferior products at high prices and prevent them from seeking better employment. Workday in the mines lasts 14, sometimes 15 hours. And the metal and coal companies have a steel grip on the towns, not just the mines. The company signs everyone's checks. Judges and police work in their favor as well as doctors. Teachers are corrupted and mold the minds of children into a structured submission to big business. Even the Colorado government hushes the voice of the people in order to pacify the companies. In 1902, the people of Colorado overwhelmingly voted in favor of a referendum advocating an eight-hour workday, but it was refused by the state legislature as being unconstitutional. Well, the fact that Americans, <coughs> men and boys, spend more than half a day locked in the tunnels facing death and injury and the other half live in life worse than dogs is more <coughs> unconstitutional to me. That's why on November 9th, 1903, a strike was called to put an end to this outrage. It started out tough in towns like Trinidad and Cripple Creek. Mining families were evicted from their homes and pushed into the streets, forced to carry their every possession on their backs camped in sh shabby tents along the mountainside and were exposed to the below freezing temperatures and wild snowstorms of the harsh Colorado winter. All the coal gone, steel mills couldn't work. Hundreds of steel workers poured into the mines as scabs. This was very discouraging, as you can imagine. I spent all my time and efforts in Colorado feeding and clothing the miners and holding meat and stuff with their spirits. I believe that if we just held our ground, the strike would be over in a matter of months. The strike was divided from the start. It was split into two areas, the northern field and the southern field, with the northern field being made up of English speakers, mostly, and the southern field consisting of immigrants, uh, Italians, Greeks, Slavs, and Mexicans. Now, a few weeks into the strike, a meeting was called between the strike leaders of the United Mine Workers Union and the presidents of the mines in the northern fields to negotiate a settlement to the strike. I was furious to learn that the agreement would exclude the southern miners. Of course, those attending the meeting were praying that I wouldn't attend. But when I got there, I told each and every one of those scoundrels that if God Almighty wanted this strike called off for his benefit and not the miners, 
I was going to raise my voice against it. The indignation of the United Mine Workers' own president, John Mitchell. Strikers return to the strike. But not for long. That coward Mitchell never stopped trying to draw out those northern miners. Eventually, he succeeded. And all support was lost for the northerners. They were forced to return to work after agreeing to the company's demands. Mitchell and I have never quite seen eye to eye. That little tosser took union money and company bribes to buy himself new suits and gold watches. His conservative methods do not serve the workers that he was elected to protect. But all his pleading and crying couldn't keep those southern miners down. Their struggle raged on for another year despite the brutality of the mine owners and the mercilessness of the mine guards. Oh. Can I ask anyone for the time? Oh. Excuse me, do you know what time it is? Five to one. Five minutes to one. Really? <laughs> That's late. Well, my, my friends, it seems I have been in your state for a whole 12 hours, and I have not <laughs> once been harassed by the police. <laughs> I should say that's record time. While continuing work in the southern field during the strike in 1903, organizers William Warjohn, Adolf Bartoli, uh, Joe Poggiani, and I were seized after a rally, taken down to the Santa Fe station, put on a train for La Junta, and told never to return. So, I did what any reasonable person would do in that situation. I went back. <laughs> the morning after our arrest, I enlisted the help of a train conductor to sneak me back on a train to Denver. The policeman hardly even missed me. What kind of a man are you if you can't even keep track of an old lady? <laughs> when I arrived in the capital, I got myself a hotel room and rested my feet a while. Seen it fit to give that foul puppet Governor James Peabody a piece of my mind, I wrote him a letter. Here, I saved a copy. <clears throat> Mr. Governor, you notified your dogs of war to put me out of the state. They complied with your instructions. I hold in my hand a letter that was handed to me by one of them which says, under no circumstances return to the state. But I wish to notify you, Governor, <coughs> that you don't own the state. When it was admitted to the Sisterhood Estates, my fathers gave me a share of stock in it, and that is all they gave to you. The civil courts are open. If I break a law of state or nation, it is the duty of the civil courts to deal with me. That is why my forefathers established those courts, to keep <coughs> dictators and tyrants such as you from interfering with civilians. I am right here, in the capital. After being out nine or ten hours, four or five blocks from your office. And I'd like to ask you, Governor, what in the hell are you going to do about it? <laughs> now, I'd love to tell a few more stories since it seems that you've, you've enjoyed them so well, but I'm afraid I'm running out of time, and I'd like to have you ask me a few questions. But if you do want to see me, I'll be speaking Friday night <coughs> on August 10th, so you all should come out <laughs> to see me. But before I go, can I get any questions?